Thanks very much. I mean, it's a real pleasure for me to be here with you in the room tonight and, of course, uh, those participating online as well. And I really would like to thank uh, Professor Anna Petrik and Garrett Crivoy for the kind invitation to take part in this programme. I was very impressed when I saw um, all the list of your lectures this uh, this week. I think you're going to be learning a lot, and I think I would learn a lot even if I, if I went and took part in the programme. Um, so Anna mentioned that we first met. It was 20 years ago, I, I had to go and check. So that was a while back. It was a competition on humanitarian law. And I remember that at the time, um, a group of my co-students were off to this other competition called Wismut in Vienna, which some of you may have heard of or participated in. And that seemed like an entirely different world. I mean, to my mind, arbitration was a method to resolve commercial disputes between companies, and it had nothing to do with public international law, international politics, issues of public interest. Um, but as you either already know, or you're going to find out in the course of this week, there are many, many more facets to arbitration. Many of those, though, have only emerged over the course of the past 20 years, already become features of arbitration. Um, arbitration really has proliferated to become the preferred method of resolving a vast range of disputes, whether it's in sports, construction, shipping, commodities, reinsurance, but also intellectual property, public international law, and to get to the focus of this lecture, energy disputes. In fact, the energy industry is the single largest user of international arbitration. In 2021, 46% of all cases registered with the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, ICSID, um, which deals with claims by foreign investors against states concerned energy related disputes and energy disputes also made up 20 to 25 percent of the arbitration submitted in 2021 to uh, the commercial institutions the court of arbitration of the international chamber of commerce and the london court of international arbitration now <laughs> the number of energy disputes definitely surged again in 2022 and it's likely to continue rising in 2023 and that's because, as you're all aware, the energy sector is currently in turmoil and many countries are still in the midst of an energy crisis. So what are the main factors driving energy disputes at the moment? Topping the list, unsurprisingly, is the Russia-Ukraine conflict, which has led to an oil and gas supply crunch, which came on top of existing supply chain disruptions due to the global pandemic. In other words, it's not only hard to get oil and gas, it's hard to get raw materials, machinery, parts, everything you need to build, operate and maintain energy projects. All of this has led to an extreme price volatility and a rise in resource nationalism on the energy market. Germany, for example, last year placed subsidiaries of the Russian oil and gas giants Gazprom and Rosneft under state trusteeship. That's a completely unprecedented move. Another effect of the conflict is the acceleration of nuclear and renewable energy projects. And also, somewhat ironically, the short-term investment in fossil fuels like coal in a push for faster independence, of course, from Russian energy sources. At the same time, states and companies are coming under increasing pressure to implement climate change commitments. And there's been a surge of regulatory changes introduced to deal with climate change. Those are directly clashing with gov government's efforts to shield their citizens from soaring energy prices. So this is definitely a mix of factors that means that we're going to see and uh, we're going to continue to see a sharp increase in energy disputes in the coming years, which of course translate, translates into a sharp increase in energy arbitrations. So what is the current landscape of energy disputes? It's all rather theoretical for now. So I'm going to run through a few concrete examples of the types of disputes that we're seeing. I mentioned the acceleration of nuclear and renewable energy projects as a consequence of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. What that means is that contractors are being pushed to deliver faster. And sometimes that means that they're cutting corners and mistakes are being made. So that leads to disputes, say for example, where a turbine is delivered to a nuclear power plant and it doesn't work. There's a dispute about whether it's because the data provided to the, by the general contractor was for the design was faulty or because the supplier's manufacturing process was defective. 
I also mentioned the short-term investment of, in fossil fuels. For example, a coal plant that was previously scheduled for decommissioning in, and destruction in Nigeria is suddenly revived, which leads to disputes with the companies that have been contracted for the decommissioning. And there's also been a real avalanche of disputes where one or even both sides are invoking force majeure and hardship to suspend, change, or terminate their contracts because of sanctions or supply disruptions. For example, last year, Russia issued a decree prohibiting Russian companies from supplying gas abroad unless they received payment in rubles, the famous rubles for gas decree. The Russian state-owned entity uh, Gazprom said that this amounts to force majeure and that it may and it may suspend supply to a number of European buyers who are refusing to pay, refusing to pay in rubles. Of course, the buyers see things differently. Um, they don't want to and sometimes can't pay in rubles. So this is a real hotbed for further disputes. There have also been numerous disputes following the reversal by Spain, Italy, and the Czech Republic of their policies on renewable energy. So Spain, for example, and this goes a bit further back, introduced a very generous incentive program in the early 2000s to attract foreign investors to renewable energy like photovoltaics. But after the global financial crisis in 2008, Spain had to roll back that scheme. That led foreign investors in renewable energy projects um, to start arbitrations against Spain under the Energy Charter Treaty, which we'll be speaking a bit more about. Um, they claimed that they had the legitimate expectation, and those of you that have already had some con contact with the investment arbitration will have heard this term before. They had the legitimate expectation when they made their investments that they would get a higher rate of return, um, and that this expectation was frustrated by Spain's reversal of its policy. Many of the investors got awarded significant amounts. In fact, the total amount was over 1 billion euros of all investors combined in compensation, and they're now seeking to enforce those amounts against Spain. And again, I said I'll come back on this point because this is one of the key challenges that energy arbitration is currently facing. But now as well, with states considering the implementation of the Paris Agreement, we're looking at a wave of regulatory changes that will likely be followed by a corresponding wave of disputes. This time, though, it might be more likely with investors in fossil fuel projects. So you can see there's a broad range of international energy disputes, and the vast majority of them are resolved through arbitration. This can be through commercial arbitration, where the dispute is between companies and generally ar arises out of a contract that includes an arbitration clause. Or it can be through investor state arbitration, where, as I mentioned before, um, the dispute is between a foreign investor and a state based either on a bilateral investment treaty or on the Energy Charter Treaty. Either way, though, arbitration is by far the preferred method of resolution for international energy disputes. Now, why is that? According to a recent survey published by Queen Mary University and Vincent Masons, there are three main features which make international arbitration the preferred method for resolving international energy disputes in particular. First, arbitration is still seen as neutral meaning that parties can avoid the domestic court system of their counterparty. Given that energy disputes in particular are often politically sensitive, this is a key feature. Think of the example I gave you just before of Gazprom invo invoking force majeure because of the Russian, the Russian counter sanctions. Picture that issue being put to a domestic court in Russia or in the EU. Um, the second feature is party autonomy and the ability to choose your arbitrators. Energy disputes often involve highly technical issues. For example, is the turbine not working because of faulty data or defective manufacturing? Parties can choose arbitrators with an engineering background or with significant experience in this type of dispute who really understand technical issues at stake. And because of party autonomy, arbitration is a lot more flexible than state court proceedings when it comes to the conduct of the proceedings. The parties and the arbitrators can discuss the process, which can be tailored towards the specific dispute, for example, by breaking the proceedings into different phases to deal with different issues. The third and actually the most important feature 
um, is the enforceability of arbitral awards. Arbitral awards can be enforced in 172 states under the New York Convention and 143 states under the ICSID convention, convention. There's nothing even remotely comparable for the recognition and enforcement of state court judgments. And as I said, enforceability was considered the main benefit of arbitration for a clear majority of the participants in the Queen Mary survey. The question is though, how are those features and benefits being impacted by the current geopolitical turmoil? What are the challenges for international energy arbitration? Let's look at the sanctions um, issued against certain Russian individuals and entities by the US, the EU, the UK, and even Switzerland in an unprecedented move. These have had a direct impact on the arbitration of energy disputes. In 2020 already, and this is before the last wave of sanctions, Russia adopted a law that presumed that sanctioned Russian parties would not receive the same level of protection in foreign court, courts and arbitral proceedings as their non-sanctioned opponents, and that those parties were therefore entitled to disregard an arbitration agreement providing for foreign arbitration and to ask a Russian state commercial court to decide the dispute. At the same time, non-Russian arbitral institutions and parties have been grappling with the practical difficulties of arbitrations involving sanctioned Russian entities, which have been exacerbated by the latest wave of sanctions in 2022. For example, given that transactions with sanctioned entities are prohibited, may an arbitral institution like the International Chamber of Commerce administer an arbitration involving a sanctioned entity? Is that a transaction? May a foreign lawyer, for example, based in the United States, represent a sanctioned party in an arbitration? This led to a lot of uncertainty, as you can imagine, over the past year especially. But the EU clarified in July 2022 that the provision of legal services to ensure access to justice, and that includes access to arbitral proceedings in a member state or for the enforcement of an arbitral award rendered in a member state, is exempt from the sanctions regime. And the UK and Switzerland issued uh, similar clarifications, meaning that in principle, at least, European lawyers may represent sanctioned Russian parties in an arbitration, arbitrators may accept appointments, and arbitral institutions may administer arbitrations involving sanctioned parties. But that doesn't mean that the difficulties have been eliminated because they may, but do they want to? Many European banks, still refuse to receive payment from a sanctioned entity. European lawyers still often refuse to represent a sanctioned party. You may have heard, for example, in the Netherlands that the Dean of the Bar of Amsterdam had to appoint someone to, had to appoint a lawyer to represent Russia. This was in state court proceedings, but it could be similar for arbitration. And some arbitral institutions might also refuse to administer cases involving such parties. So, a number of arbitrations have either been suspended or can't even start because of these difficulties. Now, the Russia-Ukraine crisis has also had a massive impact, of course, on the enforcement of awards. Right now, there's very little prospect of enforcing in Russia an award made in Europe or the UK or the US or Switzerland. And payments from or to a sanctioned entity are essentially blocked if the other party is in one of the states having issued the sanctions. Of course, you can apply for leave, but it is quite a difficult process to get payment or make payment. So enforcement outside of Russia is also very difficult in those scenarios. Now, these problems are not as such specific to energy arbitration but they are very acute in the energy sector, given the number of energy arbitrations involving Russian entities, many of which are sanctioned. Um, the effect of those sanctions is being felt both in commercial and in investor state arbitration. But investor state arbitration in the energy sector is facing some additional very significant challenges, which I alluded to before. I mentioned the Energy Charter Treaty, the ECT, in a nutshell, the ECT provides a multilateral framework for energy cooperation and has been ratified by nearly 50 states and by the European Union. It provides for arbitration as the method for resolving disputes between investors and states. 
and is in fact the most relied on treaty in investor state dispute resolution. Now, in recent years, the ECT has come under heavy criticism on several fronts. There are concerns that it protects fossil fuels and is placing a chokehold on regulatory development by states, preventing them from adopting climate friendly policies. The other main criticism focuses on arbitration as the method for investor state dispute settlement, otherwise known as ISDS. Arbitration is seen as a mechanism that, um, and here's a nice quote from a member of the European Parliament, has allowed polluting companies to challenge climate action in secretive tribunals, creating a dangerous chilling effect on climate policies. Mm. And that is how arbitration, ISDS, but also arbitration in general, since people outside don't necessarily know the distinction, is perceived with the wider public. It's a form of shadow justice being abused by greedy companies to obey, obtain awards that affect public interests while being shielded from public scrutiny. And at times like now, when energy is at the very center of nearly every political agenda, this perception of arbitration could be fatal in the energy sector. In fact, distrust of arbitration and ISTS is one of the key reasons why a number of EU member states announced last year that they would be exiting the Energy Charter Treaty. And the EU Parliament presented a motion for the EU to do the same. Now, even though the European Commission has indicated that it does not intend to support an exit, the relevance of the treaty for intra-EU disputes will be limited going forward. Some of you may be familiar with the decision of the European Court of Justice in Comstroy versus Moldova, which is a follow-on from the perhaps more famous uh, big brother, Acnea. That held, the European Court of Justice held that arbitration between an EU investor and an EU state under the ECT is incompatible with EU law. What this means in practice is that EU member states are challenging the jurisdiction of arbitral tribunals when a claim is brought against them by an investor from another EU state. And they're also resisting enforcement of arbitral awards obtained in that scenario. And they're even seeking to recover payments made to investors based on older awards because it's being considered, those payments are considered as illegal state aid by the EU. So you'll remember I mentioned the claims brought against Spain by investors in renewable energy projects. Nearly all of those investors were based in other EU member states. And Spain is leading a very highly orchestrated legal campaign to resist arbitration and enforcement with the support of the EU Commission. Um, this perception and criticism of ISDS is likely to have some spillover effect on the commercial arbitration of energy disputes, especially if they concern key projects like the Nord Stream pipeline projects, where questions have already been raised about who will be deciding the, these disputes, and again, concerns about shadow justice and secretive tribunals. All of those factors are reshaping the landscape of international energy arbitration. And the question is, how, if at all, will arbitration remain fit for purpose? Now, despite the rather bleak outlook, <laughs> I think that arbitration can and will rise to the challenge and remain the best method for resolving international energy disputes. Of course, I would say that because it's my job, but I actually do believe it. Um, but it will have to adapt and address some of the quite legitimate criticism that's been expressed. There are already efforts to increase transparency and shareholder participation in ISDS and some efforts to increase the transparency of commercial arbitration with um, some of the institutions like the ICC and the LCIA pushing to publish awards in anonymized form. That's a start, but we will likely need to go further. We might have to question whether confidentiality, which is often considered as a cornerstone of arbitration, at least commercial arbitration, can be maintained at all when issues of public interest are at stake. And the arbitration community is going to have to urgently address the speed and efficiency of the process. Now, when I started in arbitration, every single conference I went to lauded speed and efficiency as the thing that distinguished arbitration from state court litigation. Several years on, I don't think that we can say that that's the case. Um, 
Over the last decade, international arbitration has become rather unwieldy and slow. A large energy arbitration can easily take two, three, four, five, even more years. Um, and that could prove completely fatal in a fast changing environment where a decision rendered even one or two years later can be completely <coughs> obsolete. But again, I believe that arbitration can adapt and return to being a more agile process. To take an example, if you remember, I mentioned that last year Gazprom suspended its gas supply to European buyers that were refusing to pay in rubles. A Finnish company started arbitration against Gazprom in May 2022, and the award was rendered in November 2022. So barely six months later, the amounts in dispute were, I think, 300 million. And the issues were complex, so that shows that if needed, arbitration can be very fast. But the focus is perhaps still a little too much on tweaking the current system or repairing it, rather than breaking old patterns and forging new ones. To quote an American psychologist, whose quote I found preparing for this, uh, preparing for this lecture, um, Kenneth Key, if necessity is the mother of invention, conflict, conflict is its father. So the challenges to traditional energy arbitration caused by the current geopolitical turmoil and the criticism of the ECT could be seen as an opportunity to achieve some real innovation in arbitration. And now is perhaps also the time to address the fact that international energy disputes are still predominantly influ influenced by Western lawyers and Western legal concepts. Contracts and treaties and the resulting arbitrations are often being skewed in favor of the global north. But now with power balances shifting and Europe in, Europe in particular turning to new energy markets in Africa and Asia, that imbalance might start to be redressed and we may start to see new players on the arbitration scene. And that's why it's so important to foster diversity, which I hear is very much the purpose of this, of this week to foster diversity and communication between different legal cultures and to encourage a younger generation of lawyers like yourselves, I think at least for some, most of you, uh, <laughs> to review the whole process with fresh and critical eyes. So you've got your work cut out for you and we will be looking for you to help make arbitration fit for purpose for energy disputes for many years to come. Thank you. Yeah.